We're talking about how to lay hold of God's blessing, of God's plan for your life, but really the blessings of God, which is the same thing as saying God's plan. How do I lay hold of it? You know, here at Faith Family Church, we know we are entering a phase. This is a year where we're, we're to break out of things that have held us back, some things, self-centeredness and pride, some stuff that we've had in our lives that many times we didn't even see. But it's a, it's a year to break out of that so that the God of heaven can flood in your life and move so that it can cause great breakthrough in your life. And we're coming. I mean, this is the last quarter of this year, but we're going to finish very strong. You're going to see God do in the next 90 days some big things in your life. And if you be willing and obedient, I'm telling you, you'll just ride that wave. Actually, it says if you be willing and obedient in Isaiah 1, it says, it, it, in English, it says you'll eat the good of the land. In the Hebrew language, it says you'll eat the best that the land can provide. Isn't that good news? So we were talking about the children of Israel last week. Remember that. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it says that what happened to them was to be an example for us. It was to warn us because we're the ones, we're the church age. It says, upon whom the ends of the world have come. The end of this age is coming, and it's the church age, and we're living at the end of it. So these things were written about the children of Israel to show us a pattern or a type a way things work, and it, it was written so that it would warn us. It would be an admonition. It would warn us, and it would get our attention. Hey, be careful for, see, for these things. And we saw last week that the children of Israel, they came out of Egypt. They saw God move miraculously, and then what happened? Right? They went on an 11-day journey that took them 40 years. And, and since the time of Abraham, for about 600 years, God was telling them, I'm, I've already given you this land, the promised land. And now Moses was to take them in. And they got there. They're at Kadesh Benara, or I, I didn't say that quite correctly, but they're right at the Jordan River. We're getting ready. There's Jericho over here. I think it's called Kadesh Barnea is probably closer to the accurate. They're there. And they send 12 spies into the promised land to spy out the land of, of how we should take this. Ten of the 12 came back with 10 reasons that tempted God why we cannot take and have what God says he's given us. And God called that an evil report. In Hebrews, he called it an evil heart of unbelief in departing from him. So they come there. And now Joshua and Caleb are saying, no, no, we could take the land. Caleb actually stands up and stills all the people and says, no, no, let's go over now. Let's take it. We're well able because God says he's already given it to us. But then it said he couldn't overtake what this evil report was. It, the, Bible, the Bible talked about, and the people wept that night. It, they murmured. They complained constantly against Moses and against Aaron. And what happened was, at the end of it, God is saying something. So turn to Numbers chapter 14. At the end of that story that we ended last week, God says something, and he, he pronounces a principle, an everlasting, never-changing law of God. It, it, in the Hebrew language, it would be called an oracle of God. As long as he lives. And in, uh, in Numbers 14, verse 28, he pronounces it. And, and we see a principle that goes all the way through the New Testament. In Numbers 14, 8, or 14, 28, it says, Say unto the people, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. And we, and we said last week that in the Hebrew language, the verb tenses were not causative. So it really doesn't say, whatever you speak in my ears, so will I do to you. It's in the permissive verb tense. What, so what, what it literally would say is, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I allow in your life. 
It's a principle. You see it all the way in the New Testament. Mark eleven twenty three. at the end of that verse, it says, you will have what you say. We see over and over, all the way back from Genesis, we live, this is a word, planet. Everything on it, the whole planet, everything on it was created by words. Everything was. Words are so important. Words are not sounds. They're a spiritual force that goes out to do something. God never intended man to talk to communicate his feelings. Man was to talk as God talks. When God talks, he's talking to go accomplish something. His words are called to accomplish something. When he says to you, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. His word has, is so full of life and power that it enables you to do all things through Christ because he strengthens you. This is how his words work. So in Numbers 14.8, it's huge. And so now if you fast forward all the way to the New Testament, we, we spoke this scripture last week. Go to Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 23. We're talking about how to lay hold. This is the way it works, guys. Your words either open the door for the enemy to come in and steal, kill, and destroy, or your words can shut the door so he can never get in. Your words open the door for God to be able to get over to you everything he's already given you, or your words can close the door so that God can't because he won't ever violate your will. Here's the good news with this tonight. You can have what you say. Now here under this context, we are to say what God says. See, you can't just say whatever you want and it come to pass. Because you have to believe what you say. You only lay hold of the promises of God as you have faith, which means you believe what you're saying. Well, faith only comes, it doesn't come from hearing Tony Finley's words. It comes from hearing God's words. So this is why in Hebrews chapter 10, look at what it says. It says, hold fast to the profession, right? Hold, let, us hold, let us hold fast to the profession of our faith. Really, forget the word our. It's in italics in the King James Version. It was added by the translators to bring clarity to the context. I don't like it because it, it literally says, let us hold fast the profession of faith. Paul didn't say, I was and am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. But it's not I that live, it's Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, he didn't say this, I live by my own faith in the Son of God. He said, no, no, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Right? I live by the faith of the Son of God. So let us hold fast the profession of faith without wavering. Why? For he is faithful that promised. The profession in that word is the key. The Greek word is homo logeo. It literally, it doesn't just mean to talk. It means to say the same thing. Well, if you look at the context, say the same thing as what? Say the same thing that God says. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. That sounds awesome right up until you just feel real bad and you feel real weak and you feel like this is not working out and everything within you and the enemy's throwing thoughts, man, you just need to vent. You just need to vent. This is not fair. What's happening to you? And, and, and you know, he's trying to get you riled up for 20 years so that you speak death. So just, I'm just going to tell you how I feel. Don't do that because that'll bring death in your life. We're to hold fast to saying what God says. I can do all things through Christ 
who strengthens me. When all hell's breaking loose and it looks like you're going under, Father, I thank you that it is written. You always cause me to triumph in Christ. I've asked this according to your will. I've made a requirement, a demand for what you said you've already given me. And I know that if I ask anything according to your will, you hear me. And if I know you hear me, I know I already have what you've asked me. It's written in 1 John chapter 1 or 1 John chapter 5. See, we, we have to hold fast because there the enemy is trying to get you to let go of that. Get rid of these phrases. Well, I just think. I just believe they should do this. Those, those phrases will bring death in your life. So what will help you is to pause before you talk. We might get into this, but look at the story of Moses. I mean, here's Moses. He, from day one, was to deliver Israel from Egypt and take them into the promised land. That was the call on his life. And over and over, the people would murmur against him. And he'd go to the Lord on their behalf. And he would, you know, in humility, God, don't kill him out here in the, in the wilderness, you know. Just, and, and, and just, he's pleading their case over and over. But could you imagine how hard they'd murmur against him, then God would deliver him, then they'd murmur about something else. And then one day, it came where the people are murmuring about water. And all of a sudden, God tells them. I mean, here's the people. They're murmuring. Would it would have been better if we lived, you know, still slaved than all this other stuff in Egypt? And you know, we have no water out here and all this stuff. And the Bible says, the glory of the Lord and the presence of the Lord came. And the Lord said to Moses, I want you to get this rock and I want you to say to this rock, and I'll bring water out of it for the people. Moses, we might have to read this whole story one night because Moses goes to the people and he is ticked. And, and if you look at his words, he's ticked. He, and, 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 and he starts saying some crazy things. You know, pretty much in English, I'm done with you people. You, you rebellious people. Now, here's a little thing about your speech. You reap what you sow. Because what is he saying? You rebellious people, we'll, we'll give you water. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean we'll give you water? You and Aaron? Do you see how he got out of... God's going to give you water now. I'll, I'll give you water. And he sma God told him to talk to the rock. He hits it with the rod. He hits it again. And then water comes out. God still brings water out of it, even though Moses was rebellious. Isn't that crazy? Just because a minister, God does miracles through his life, don't, don't, be careful. Because Moses, God allowed Moses to do a miracle. But then, but then, God told Moses, because of what you've done, you will not go into the promised land. What? Do you mean what Moses said stopped him from fulfilling the plan of God for his life? Yes. We even have an interaction in, in the Old Testament where Moses goes to God and goes, hey, I need to talk to you about this. Can I, can, I, can I please go in? And God's response to him. Now, is God good? Yes. Does he forgive? Yes. Did he forgive Moses? Yes. We have this idea, though, that just because we forgive, we change. Or just because God forgives, he changes. No. No. He told Moses, I don't want you to ever talk to me about this again. Now, did he love Moses? Yeah. The people still went in. God even showed him the land. This guy lived to 120 years old. Could you imagine? You're 120 years old. Your eyes, are, you're still 20-20 vision. 
you're still building muscle in the gym. You still have you vigor and all this other stuff. And God goes, you know, it's, it, it's time for you to die. I, I, I just, you know, I, I really, you know, it's time for you to die. You've lived out all your days, Moses. Come on, it's time for you to come home. So can you, can you walk up and climb up that mountain and die? I'll bury you. Don't worry about it. Could you imagine? I mean, this guy was blessed, but his words kept him out. Do you ever read that story in Matthew about the temptation of Jesus? Have you ever went to Texas Roadhouse? They have those. They're like this big. They are hot. Those buns. Have you ever, I mean, you walk in the place and you smell them. And then they put this butter I don't even know what's in the butter, but, it, you know, it's, it's just really good, right? Have you ever smelled warm homemade bread? Pretty incredible. Could you imagine what it would smell like if you didn't eat anything for 40 days and 40 nights? So after, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, thank God Jesus wasn't weak. He was very strong spiritually. He was very weak physically. And then the enemy came to him and said, if you be the son of God, and then here is the word that unlocks the key of this whole thing. Jesus, if you're the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Command. Attitude. He's saying, Jesus, I want you to speak, not by what your father says. I want you to just speak it. Now, it had to be a genuine temptation. Otherwise, it, you know. So Jesus could have spoke, but he's like, no, I am not saying anything that my father doesn't prompt me to say with the right heart and the right attitude. No, Satan, I am not giving you that. So how does he respond? How can he overcome that? Because he was full of the Spirit and full of the Word of God. He responded to Satan. It is written, man doesn't live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So this is what we're talking about, to lay hold. It's your words. Hebrews 10.23, let's read it again. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, because he's faithful that promise. Now jump down just a few chapters ahead. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. You guys doing okay? The only way that this could be a better church service is if it was three hours long. But that's all right. We, we still, we like our hour and 15, hour and 30. We could live with that, right? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. It says, let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Well, that's kind of weird because Paul told Timothy that God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. But in the literal Greek, it literally, this word fear, it literally means let us be cautious. Let us be aware and let us be diligent. That's what that word means in the Greek. Let us therefore be cautious, aware, and diligent, diligent, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So let's be aware, let's be cautious, lest a promise that he gave you, you won't be able to walk in it. And then he says this, for unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them or as well as unto the children of Israel. Talking about that numbers account that we were talking about. The gospel was preached to them over and over for 600 years. God says, I've given you this land. It's a good land. It flows with milk and honey. I constantly have my eyes on this land. You don't, it's not like Egypt. You don't water it with your foot. It's not about your works. I water it with rain from heaven. And I, I give the former and I give the latter rain. I mean, it's a good land. Over and over and over, God kept telling them that. But it says, they heard that gospel. It says, but the word preached did not profit them. 
Why did it not profit the children of Israel? It tells us right here, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So they didn't mix it. So every one of you, I'm just so glad that tonight you brought your mixer with you. Right? If you didn't bring your mixer, we need to pray because that's crazy. Okay? But your mixer's your mouth. So what happened to the children of Israel is they walked around in the wilderness. They, they looked at what they saw instead of looking at what God said. And they, you always will say what you see. So they were speaking, you know, we, why don't we have this and why don't we have that? And they're murmuring and complaining constantly, constantly. And then when it all comes down, because of all those years of murmuring, complaining, not believing God, all this stuff, not being thankful, when the spies came back, all of a sudden it's a principle you always see personal mess up and mess up and mess up and mess up God forgives them they mess up God forgives them they mess up they God forgives them and then all of a sudden it seems like they do it one more time and then they're ruined so so we want to learn from these things because guys as you sit here tonight as children of God your spirit man is indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God and literally sin, the power of it, has been broken off your life. We can't say there was a show in the 70s, the, what was it, with, was it Sanford and Son, right? And, and Flip, was his name Flip Wilson? Yeah, he would always say the devil made me do it. But see, we can't say that as Christians because the devil can't make you do it. You have to choose it. So the cool thing is you don't have to choose it. That's good news, isn't it? So, so here we have all these principles, and it says the only reason why they didn't go in the promised land is they didn't mix faith. How does that apply to you? So if you will mix faith with the gospel, you'll be able to obtain your inheritance. So what am I saying? Do you see poverty and lack in your life? It has no legal right there. You could use the word of God. You can speak what God says about that and get it out of your life. Do you know the Bible says you can bind spiritual things? You, whatever you bind on earth, the Bible says, will be bound in heaven. So it's like you speak it here and God speaks it there and says that's bound. Isn't that good news? So you can literally speak the word of God, you're mixing it with faith, and it will cause you to inherit the promised land. Do you know it's impossible for you to lack in God because he's already provided everything you'll ever need? All you're complaining about, if you're complaining about lack, is you're complaining about something you just don't see. But oh, you have it. You just can't lay hold of it because you, you're choosing to look at what you see instead of what's unchangeable, what God says. It's very, very simple. And here's the thing. The Lord will help you do it. He always will work with you. Isn't that good news? So if you look at this now, it says here, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. What hap what's happening in this passage of Scripture is they're saying the wrong thing. So they're getting what they're saying, but they're not getting what God wants because they're not saying it. Right? So now, let's go back. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. I, ca I can't, as your pastor, I can't tell you how big this is in me. Because this, this, we have to, we have to get to where our words have weight. To where we believe the thing that we're saying will come to pass. We have to get there. And you can't get there if you lie. Got to stop lying. Even about little things. Go over to somebody's house and they fix something. And they could have fixed it wonderfully 
but you just don't like it. And then they ask you, oh, how do you like that? And you're like, well, yeah, you know, it's good. You just lied. And we think that's such a little thing. But then when your child has 104 fever at 1 o'clock in the morning and you want to declare and, and say in the name of Jesus, fever you leave, and it doesn't work because you don't believe what you say because you've told little lies. Right? I kind of, just little lies. There's no little lies. Satan loves them. Because what you're doing is you're training yourself to where your, your words mean nothing. Why do you think, do you think he likes gossip and judging because of what it does to people? He doesn't really care. It's what it does to the person who's speaking it. Because it's impossible to walk in love. Faith works by love. So it's impossible to walk in faith if you're talking about other people. See, we always look at, you know, uh, what it does to, to situations. Forget all that. What does it do to the individual? Man, I'm so glad I love the word repent. Because I have opened the door so wide that the enemy could bring a 747 in here. And, and in a moment of time, I could repent. I could change my mind and shut that door, and he runs right into the door and can't get to me. This is the way we can live, guys. We watch our words. We measure our words with the word of God because we're not talking to just communicate our feelings. We are putting spiritual law in motion to accomplish something. When you talk to another brother or sister, you are speaking life. You're, you're communicating and your words are bringing grace to the people to help them walk out their plan. Every, and that'll turn you on like nothing else because you and I are wired for that. So Deuteronomy chapter 11, let's start in verse 8. So here we have, now this, this story, Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell address. He knows he's going home to be with his, to be with his Lord, right? He knows he's going home now, and he, these are his last words to the children of Israel because he's going to turn this whole thing over to somebody else who's going to be Joshua, and he's going to lead them in. So what is this? This is 40 years later from the first time, from that Numbers story. 40 years later, everybody 20 and older is dead. Everybody got in that story in Numbers, 40 years earlier, everybody got what they said. It's a principle, right? So now 40 years later, everyone 20 and older is dead, and here they are. Where are they? They're at Kadesh Barnea again. And now God's talking to Moses about them going over what it's going to be like, what they need to do to go over and possess this land. But they're at the same place again. We said it last week. It's a spiritual law. You can't go to first grade unless you pass kindergarten. You'll, you can't go to step two of God's plan for your life until you go through step one, right? I mean, you see that in the word of God everywhere. So in verse eight, it says, now he's telling them how to possess the land. He says, therefore, you shall keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land whither you go to possess it. Never forget this. From this verse and others, it says keeping God's word gives you the strength to possess your inheritance. It's the keeping of God's word. Do you see that? It says here, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore, which the Lord swore unto your fathers to give unto them, and to their seed, a land that flows with milk and honey. For the land whither you go to possess it, it's not a land like Egypt. From whence you came out, where you sowed your seed and watered it with your foot as a garden of herbs. 
the promised land is not like Egypt, where you were a slave, where you had to plant your seed and you had to water it with your foot, with your work. This is not the way the promised land is. This is not the way your spiritual inheritance is. If you need healing in your body, you don't have to plant your seed of healing and keep doing all the works and hoping it'll come out. No, 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 no. Cancer doesn't leave your body that way. But cancer knows his name. And cancer has to bow to his name. It's, so we're going we're gonna to see a pattern here. Just hang with me. It says, for the land where you go to possess it, it's not like the land of Egypt. So now we go down to verse 11. But the land whither you go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys, and it drinks water of the rain of heaven. Our land is a land that Jesus has purchased for us. Okay, this is what we're talking about. A land which the Lord thy God cares for. See, you're gonna, where we're going with this is our land is spiritual truth. That Jesus bore my sickness and carried my pain. That's part of my inheritance. Right? That's part of my land. My God meets all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I have the joy of the Lord and the peace of God. I have the freedom. These are all spiritual blessings. It says here, it's a land which the Lord thy God careth for. Look at this. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. Sounds a lot like I watch over my word to perform it. Sounds a lot like my eyes are looking to and fro in the whole earth to see who I can show myself strong on behalf of. Doesn't that sound a lot like that? It says, verse 13, And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that you may, may gather in your corn and wine and oil. So we see from this verse, our land is totally dependent upon heaven. And this is the mission for a child of God. We're not trying to get to heaven. We're, we're the church on the earth. We have been called by God to bring heaven to this earth so that the people that don't know the Lord can see how good God is. And we can't do that if we're in lack, right? This is why we got to start talking right. Why is so much of the body of Christ sick? Because we're not talking right. Why do we have church splits and all this nonsense going on? Because we're not talking right right? We're playing games. Well, all this is over. We're going to lay hold of what God has for us to lay hold of. We're going to yield all of our fruit in our season. But it all starts with our mouth. So let's look at this rain, because there's a scripture that gives us a great picture of rain. Go to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 God's word says this in Isaiah 55, 8. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Now, the, this word thought in the Hebrew language means plans and purposes. God is saying, my plan and my purpose is not yours. Okay? Neither, it says here, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Now, this word ways in the Hebrew language means course of action. So God is saying, listen, guys, my plans and my purposes are not yours. They're not the same. And the way I do things is not the same as the way you do things. Now, why is God saying that? Because God is saying, if you want to prosper, if you want to walk in my blessings, you got to let go of your plan and your purpose. you got to let go of your course of action, the way you handle things. 
because you're going to get in a financial position to where you're going to be in lack and you're going to think, to get out of it, I need to save. When God is saying, no, 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 you got to give. You'll get in a situation where you think, well, I, see, you won't realize that really for me to live, I'm going to have to kill some things in my life. And oh my gosh, if I really want to be first, oh, I'm going to have to be last. Right? God will come into your situation when everything, and you've messed up, so, I mean, I've been here, where you made so many wrong decisions that you are on the edge of the edge of the edge. You, it's already over, and you're like, man, I can't make, I can't have one more bad thing happen. And God will say, yeah, what I want you to do is forget about all that. And just come spend time with me. And start doing this. And start, and so here. And you're, you're just like, in your mind, you're going, what? what? But no, 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 no. If you let go of your plans and purposes, if you let go of your course of action, and you just come to God and say, okay, I know your word is true. I, I don't know really how to walk by faith, but I, need, I know I need to. And I know you're faithful. I know you'll help me. There's an anointing coming up me saying this right now. So I'm just going to get over myself, and, and whatever you tell me to do, I'll just do. And I believe that I have the helper, the Holy Spirit on the inside. He's going to lead me into all the truth of this. So I'm just going to do it. Sink or swim, live or die, I'm going for you. Because I've done it the other way for a long time, and it doesn't work. This is what this is all about. And then he says this. Now he's going to explain some things. He says in verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. So, so are my course of action higher than your course of action, and my plans and purposes than your plans and purposes. And then he says this. For as the rain comes down, remember God says, I will I'm good. This promised land, I will cause the rain. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but it waters the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. See, God is saying, I'm going to water your land. God is sending his word. He says, just as the physical rain comes, now he's going to tell us what this rain from heaven really is. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. That means it will never return to me without power. It has just as much power. It never loses power. The word of God never loses power. So that promise that he gave you, that you saw 10 years ago, has just as much power in it today. Yeah, but Tony, you don't understand, I messed up so bad. No, no, his power is much greater than your mess-ups. His mercy is much greater than your disobedience. I mean, it, it, it says right in verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, I mean, he's saying here, let the wicked man forsake his course of action. And the unrighteous man, forsake your plans and purposes. Let him return to the Lord, and the Lord will have mercy on him. And to our God, not only mercy, it says he'll abundantly pardon you. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at all kinds of pardoned people. Stop speaking your past. It's gone. How do you get over your past? You forget what your past is and you press into who your future is. Stop talking about that junk, that mistake you made 20 years ago. Yeah, but you don't understand. I've got a criminal record and how am I going to get a job? No, no, God understands that and that doesn't mess you up. Because you don't, see, your prosperity is not dependent upon your work. It's dependent upon what God does. And God spoke, and he sent the rain of his word into your life and said, listen, I'll make you the head and not the tail. I'll make you above and not beneath. Because I'm your shepherd, you will never want, you'll never fail, you'll never be decreased or diminished, and you'll never lack. It's my blessing that makes you rich. Isn't that good news? 
It says here, so shall be my word that goes forth of my mouth. It'll return, it won't return unto me void, but it will accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper into the thing whereunto I sent it. See, God, this, this land that we're talking about, this is why faith is a rest. You cease from your own works. Now you just work out what God's working in. You just say what he says. You have cares tonight, just roll them over on him. We sang that. You roll it over on him, he cares for you. You're not made or created to carry any cares. You can't. See, if you're carrying them, he can't. Because he'd have to violate your will to carry them, and he won't do that. But he'll woo you to give him the big mess that you created. Have you ever created? Don't, don't, you don't have to lift your hands because we already know it's a resounding every one of us has created big messes. God, in the book of James, God says he's the God that gives to all men liberally. He'll give you more than enough and he doesn't upbraid you. That means he doesn't get down on you for the mess you created. Man, when I found that out, I'm like, that's really cool because I've probably created some monumental messes. But to God, it's like no big deal. Just give it to me. I'll, I'll straighten it out. Isn't it cool? As I stand here today, nothing in my past will keep me from literally fulfilling the whole plan of God. And I'll stand before Jesus, and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I mean, I'm going to be sitting there going, wow, this is really cool, because in reality, I didn't really do it. I was just willing and obedient, but actually, Jesus, you did it. Isn't that awesome? Don't try to fix your life. You can't. But he's already fixed it. So he'll teach you how to walk right into all that. So simple. And he does it with his word. So let's jump back to Deuteronomy chapter 11 here. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 15. Hallelujah. I know, I know the Lord's speaking to some people tonight. I hope that you're, you're just getting some great hope built up in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 15. It says, And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. That must be okay to God, to eat and be full. Right? <laughs> well, I mean, I know you're laughing. But if you think about it, do you know how much of the body of Christ teaches that we have to live in poverty? No, no, God wants you to be full. Yeah. See, and, and, and see, this is the thing. We think, if in, in our self-centered flesh, that full is, means that I'm full. But you're a child of God, so the only way you could ever be full is if you've given everything that you have in your heart to give. So it's not only you, it's you yielding all your fruit. That's what full is. Isn't that cool? Because see, you're not really made to be here for you. God placed you here for a multitude of people that don't know him. And when you step into that call that's on your life, It'll change you forever. And pretty soon, you'll be running after God because it's bigger than what you are and, and the blessing of God just overtakes you. And, then, and the blessing of God will actually be seen by your fruit and will attract them to you. It's really amazing. And it all starts with your mouth. And I will send grass in the fields, verse 15, for thy cattle that thou mayest eat and be full, Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and that you turn aside and serve under other gods and worship them. So when you're blessed, when God blesses you, he's saying, take heed to yourself. Once again, we don't need to look at what anybody else is doing. We got to take heed to ourselves, Because if you don't, Next thing you know, you're going to be serving something else. 
God's going to bless you with this fishing boat. It's exactly what you wanted. If you don't be careful, we'll never see you in church again because you'll always be on a lake fishing. He'll bless you with this wonderful cabin, and then next thing you know, there's no ministry in your local church or in your life now because you are always got to be at the cabin. And then you end up divorced, and your kids aren't serving God. And Now, if you turn back to him, he'll fix all of it. But why go through that? Does that make sense? So this is what Moses is saying here. It says here, verse 17, And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and you be shut up, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the, rain, or that the land yield not her fruit, lest you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord gave you. Do you see how our land is totally dependent upon God's word? Therefore shall you lay up thy, my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. What is that, what is that describing? That is describing somebody who is meditating in the word day and night so that they become a doer of the word. Always remember this. And meditating in the word, it means to mutter, to say to yourself over and over and over. If you do that, when you speak God's word over and over to yourself, it builds a, builds a bridge to take you from being a hearer of the word to being a doer of the word. Because the hearer's not blessed, only the doer's blessed. Does that make sense? This is a huge principle in the Word of God. It says, verse 19, And you'll teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, and you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. Do you, do you know the number one reason why I have 3 John 2 as, a, as my license plate? I've, I've ministered to so many people because they'll be like, well, what is 3 John 2? And when I tell them it's a, it's a verse in the Bible, they're like, ew, almost, you know? And I'm like, oh man, it's a great verse. It, it says, beloved, I pray above all things that you would prosper and be in health. And people, everybody, I, I've never had somebody go, oh, that's stupid. Everybody goes, that's in the Bible? Right? And it opens a door. Everything about your life is to speak of the Word of God. Now, you got to be careful with the little fish on the back of cars, though. <laughs> right? When I was younger, I had to take that little fish off my car after I pulled somebody out of a car in, the, in front of people. And I just remember, I'm like, oh my gosh. So I went home and I took that. You'll never see a fish on my car. Now, I don't do that anymore. Okay, I'm under, you know, I don't, I, that, I, could, I could get myself in trouble as a 56-year-old, right? Especially now. But anyway, as we go on, you got to be careful. Just because somebody has something written doesn't mean you trust them with all of your heart. You know, if you get a business card with a little fish on it, you want to make sure it's not a great white shark, right? <laughs> so you just want to use wisdom. But what I'm saying here is you meditate in the Word. Everything. You go, you go turn on a, your car and the word starts playing. Your, your, your whole life is you're just, I just want to know God. This is what this is talking about. It says here in verse 21, that your days, you do all this, that your days may be multiplied as, as the days of your children. Wow. So as you follow God, you can multiply your days. Everybody thinks, well, you know, when your time is up, your time is up. Well, the Bible does say we have an appointment to die. It's appointed once for men to die. But guess who sets that appointment? You do. And you could shorten your days here, or you could, this is saying if you'll keep the word and meditate in the word, you will multiply your days and the days of your children. Wow, that's pretty intense. Now remember, I didn't say that. This is what the Word says, and the Word is true. 
Isn't that awesome? It says here that your days may be multiplied and the, and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them. And then look at this. As the days of heaven upon the earth. What is days of heaven on the earth? It means that God's will is done for you on the earth. It means that you live down here like you're living up there. Do you think any of us will be stressed about money up there? Do you think any of us will be not fulfilled? Right? Do you think any of us will have, you know, uh, physical problems and, and just not knowing what to do? And, you know, oh, man, I got to get, you know, I, I just, we probably won't take supplements up there. Right? We probably won't have to do any of that. Well, listen, God down here, now, now don't, don't say I'm not telling you to take supplements because down here you need to take supplements, okay? But I'm talking about there's no depression in heaven. There's no fear in heaven. There's nobody who's going to lose sleep in heaven. God will give you sleep here. And, and you know, some torment that's going on in, in I don't know how many people here. Sometimes when you sleep, there's torment and there's, there's thoughts and, and, and there's this, it seems like a dream, but it's just terror. It's fear. It's anxiety coming upon you when you sleep. In Jesus' name, that's broken over your life right now. So receive that. God gives his beloved sleep. No more of the enemy messing with you with your sleep. It says in verse 22, For if you shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, and to cleave to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you, and you shall possess greater nations and, my, and mightier than yourselves. Every place wherein the soles of your foot tread upon shall be yours. This is a big statement. Everywhere where the soles of your foot tread upon shall be yours. New Testament believer, every place you walk in faith is yours. From the wilderness, and then he lays all this out. Then he says in verse 25, there shall no man be able to stand before you this means to stand in front of you and block you from doing what God's called you to do. No man can ever stop you. So if somebody's trying to stop you, don't get mad at them. They're not your enemy. The enemy's your enemy. And the good news about that, the enemy's defeated in your life. It says, For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon the land that you shall tread upon, as he hath said unto you. What does that sound like? If you humble you, if you submit your, humble yourself, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. He'll leave, he'll stop messing with you. Now, he's an idiot, so he'll come back. So you just keep speaking the truth, right? This is so, so very important. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. See, what I want you to see from this is the doer of the word is the one that possesses their inheritance. It's the doer. What is the doer? He's a person who believes the word of God in his heart and he speaks it out of his mouth. Why does he believe it in his heart? Because he meditates in it day and night. And as you get full of the word, Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. So now... You take thoughts captive. You surround yourself with people of like faith that will encourage you and help you. Because we don't take and get our inheritance alone. We get it together. And so now I'm in this environment. I'm around, I'm around Pastor Edwin, who's always, we go out and we talk about the word. We get so excited. It's just, that's, and so I'm surrounding myself with people. We fellowship over the word, 
right? I, I go to lunch with Jack and Jeannie, and we, we have to bring our Bibles because it's so good. And we just, you know, sometimes we almost, if it wasn't for work, we'd probably stay till dinner, right? Because it's just, you get built up. And you're constantly being built up. You get in your car, and you're not listening to K-Doubt. You, you, you make a playlist that literally, no offense, but you, you make a playlist of songs that declare who you are in Christ, who he is, how he's good. You don't sing songs, oh, my life is a mess. and you know, No, because your life isn't a mess. Right? If your life outwardly is a mess, that's not the way it really is. And so now is when I need to speak and say, no, Lord, I give you this mess. Here it is, and now I'm just going to seek you, and I'm going to declare your word, and everything is going to change in my life. I'm no longer bound. I'm free. And so now I walk and I meditate in the word day and night. It takes me from being a hearer to a doer, and now I simply can lay hold of the plan of God for my life. So many believers, and I'll close with this, do not see the plan of God for their life because their eyes are completely set on themselves. You can't see anything when you're looking at yourself. You see everything when you look at him. And so now the doer, James 1, through 25, the doer of the word, he, what does he do? He looks at the word of God. He peers into it. He continues therein. And everything he does is blessed. Amen?